Didn't I see most of you just less than 24 hours ago? <laughs> Some of us, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a small but dedicated group. You said it. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, everybody. I just got I bumped myself out, but I think everybody's here. So we are recording and we're live on YouTube. So um, let's get the meeting started. It is 4.02. Um, we have a quorum. Um, we have an agenda for today. Then before I turn it over to Francisco. Um, so I'll call the meeting to order at 4.02. Um, and we sent the agenda um, with a copy of the minutes from the last meeting. So I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes unless someone has any comments on those. I'll make a motion to accept the last month's meeting or uh, minutes. Uh, can I get a second by somebody? Second. Second Perry. by Terry. Okay, um, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Great. Motion carried unanimously. And let me, um, give me one second, Francisco. Okay, so I am sharing the screen. So we're gonna jump into the agenda today. We're gonna talk about, as you know, uh, environmental resources, open space, sustainability needs. So with that, Francisco. I will share my screen and we'll, we'll get things started. Uh, first, I do want to uh, introduce everyone to Anthony Zemba, who is on our team that is joining us today to talk about uh, some of your environmental resources. And Anthony, can you uh, wave your hand, say hi, so folks know who you are? Hello, everybody. Uh, Hello. You can hear me good? Tell yeah. me a little bit about your credentials and what you do, Anthony. Impressive. Thanks, them. yeah. Uh, my name is Anthony Zemba. I'm a, a senior ecologist with uh, FHI. And sorry about looking this way. Uh, for some reason, my primary screen is not on. It's just black. But hey, at least I got one screen and I can see all of you if I look this way. So I'm not looking away from you. I'm actually looking at you. Uh, my role at FHI as a senior ecologist is to help with uh, conservation and management plans um, that we prepare for uh, both um, private organizations, uh, land trusts, non-governmental organizations like the Audubon Society, and um, etc. Et um, and I also do uh, help with environmental impact statements, looking at uh, the natural resources of the affected environment and uh, ways that we could avoid or minimize or mitigate the impacts uh, for various projects, um, usually uh, related to um, infrastructure improvement. Uh, better roads, uh, better bridges, safer roads, safer bridges, and things like that. Um, so uh, I've often uh, been consulted with um, on a town-wide basis, looking at uh, multiple properties uh, and prioritizing uh, which properties would best uh, serve as uh, conservation lands, which ones would best serve as uh, recreational opportunities. Or, or perhaps how to marry uh, both uses on uh, the same properties. Thanks, Anthony. So Anthony will be bringing that expertise to our work and it's, his expertise is, is particularly relevant to a POCD and we're gonna get into all the reasons for that. Uh, Marcy is joining us as well. And, and Marcy, do you still have a hard stop at 5.30 today? Because if you do, I might have you just give everyone uh, an update on where we are with uh, public engagement right now. Yeah, I, I actually do. I'm sorry, I actually okay. have another meeting this evening. Well, um, well, it's just that everything. week. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll probably need to get off around like 5.15-ish. Yeah, so um, in case we run long, why don't you give everyone just a brief rundown of where we're at, what we're working on right now. Okay. So if many of you remember um, or where we're um, helping Francisco with the community engagement and um, the first thing that I do want to mention is uh, the survey, which is we are going to get back from translation tomorrow um, and we're translating it into Spanish and Portuguese. And so our plan is to have it online, ready to go Thursday. Um, 
we'll send it along to Sharon to do one final once over um, and we should be ready to go. There's a couple of things that we're going to do to advertise this and um, we're working on some posters and so that we can get them out in e-blast. And Sharon, I think maybe you and I should talk offhand Thank you. this week. And, um, you know, I know there's definitely some strategies, eBlast. I know West Cog is really good about distributing stuff. Um, so we, we, we should talk about that before Friday. The other thing that we are doing is we have two pop-ups planned in the next few weeks. One is on Friday at the farmer's market. And then the other one is on the 15th, about three weeks later at the farmer's market. Sharon, I also want to talk to you about that because it's supposed to pour on Friday. <laughs> and we might, um, and we've talked to Peggy about other stuff. So if it makes sense to you, I'll watch the weather tonight and then maybe call her and see if we can come on the first instead. Just postpone it one week. Yeah, I gave her the heads up. I asked her some questions about that today. But we, because we're still kind of, there, there aren't a lot of opportunities, we thought we, and just so the committee members know, we thought we, you know, take a little booth at the farmer's market, um, um, introduce this to the have some materials present. Um, and then we've also, Marcia will explain, we've also, I've also had some discussions with the principal at the high school um, about kind of getting, um, getting it out there. Um, um, uh, in various forms. So uh, we're working well, on Sharon, Marcy, real quick, I'd love to be, you know, a city center ambassador or representative to kind of show you around, introduce you to people. And I can't be there this Friday. So next Friday would be better as well oh, for me. The first, well, if, if it's raining, we definitely don't want to be there <laughs> because no one's going to stop and talk to us. And the other thing is, you know, we, we, we've kind of designed this plot that we're going to put on the table where we want people to put stickies and things like that and and we just know from past experience that unless the weather's nice people don't really hang out and chit chat with us um i, I already i have a spanish speaker coming with us on the 15th um and so i i can cover that and then sharon i think i have one other idea that we could potentially do that um uh, we're doing in a few weeks for the other Danbury project that um, we're we're setting up shop in front of um, a, a local market, Brazos, and um, that might be an idea if we're looking for one more event. And, and we could always wait and see how that goes. And if it if it's a success, um, maybe we do something like that. Sure. I mean, I'm, again, I'm all for trying to get out in front of okay. the public any which way we can. So, okay. and I need to follow up Richard's on to um, uh, Richard Ginelli about um, Francisco and I getting on, um, you know, uh, okay. with him. So we can follow that up as well. Okay. And then um, we'll talk and then we'll reach out to Perry when we have a decision about sure. this Friday versus next Friday. Okay. Thank Great. you. And I'll try to be there all Fridays other than this one anyways. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Also, Sharon. If yes. you uh, want additional distribution, I might be able to. We have a, a, a lady that works for us on, on the Board of Ed that puts out uh, different PR releases that we have. It goes out to newspapers and basically to all the parents in the schools. So if we write up some sort of a verbiage as to what we're doing, a story behind it, I may be able to get her to print it and just tie in how this affects the, the education and, and you know, what we're doing uh, how it affects the the education of Danbury in, in terms of us looking ahead 10 years and, and the schools being part of the city, they can give us some good press on that and, and it's free. Great. That would be great. Yeah, I'm working on a press release with um, with Marcy, um, you know, on our end and we'll just be able to get it out to who. Sure. Yeah. So it's a different, you know, it's a different audience. And I look at it, the more we get, the more we hit, the better off we are. Absolutely. No question about that. Okay. So Thank great. You. It's great input. Okay. And we'll do posters. All right, so we'll talk offline and confirm some of the details. Perfect, thank you. Thanks. Okay, yeah, thanks Marcy for, for giving them the, the rundown. Um, so our, our agenda, a uh, little bit out of order today uh, <laughs> because of some time constraints here, but uh, today we're focusing on uh, open space environmental resources and issues. 
Um, and Marcy already gave you a brief rundown of where we're at with public engagement. I'll fill you in a little bit more to, towards the end and, and then talk about uh, where some of our other work is, including uh, we've started conducting interviews with uh, uh, some key stakeholders and uh, related to our POCD work is the affordable housing plan. So I'll give you an overview of that. All right, uh, I'm gonna get things started over. At some point, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Anthony to talk about some of the environmental resources, but let me, let me frame it for you. Um, uh, Danbury, of course, has a tremendous uh, and diverse environmental resources, and they include wetlands, your groundwater, various habitats, uh, floodplain areas, which are really important to you know, protecting habitat, water quality and properties, uh, your streams, lakes and rivers, of course, and uh, your open space properties, which vary quite a bit in character, size and contribution to your local environment. Uh, so how, and, and the question that, uh, you know, Sharon kind of posed to us as we we're preparing for today's meeting is, you know, how do these factor into the POCD? What is, what is the relevance and, and what do we do with all this information? And so, um, first of all, the state mandates us to take a look at these resources as part of the POCD. And uh, really requires the POCD uh, promote, uh, you know, efficient, economical and responsible development of, of the community. Um, we also need to recommend uh, the most desirable land uses with an, an eye towards conservation, and that's the C part of the POCD. Uh, another responsibility the community has is to protect your drinking water supplies, which are directly linked to growth. Uh, you, you can't have growth if you don't have drinking water to support that growth, despite what's happening in the western part of the country right now. Um, and, uh, and furthermore, that we establish policies that are consistent with the state and regional plans, which also have uh, open space and environmental goals, policies, and, and strategies. Um, in, in addition to that, the plan really provides us an opportunity to inventory your environmental and open space resources, to understand what the needs, issues, and deficiencies are and uh, to provide recommendations that will protect those resources, enhance them as needed, all of which is aimed to improve and protect the quality of life in Danbury and to make continued growth possible. And, and one of the key phrases here is gonna be sustainability. And so let me talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, sustainability is, I, I expect it to be a theme that's going to be present throughout the plan. Um, and we, we speak about sustainability broadly um, in that uh, sustainability means being able to continue uh, your operations, your way of life, your, your habitat, everything about your community, being able to continue in the future without detriment to anything. And so that's, it's a very broad idea and it, it's, it's very obvious with respect to environmental implications, but there are also things like operational sustainability. This, the city needs to plan for being able to continue maintaining its facilities, its infrastructure, maintaining and sustaining a level of services that it provides to its residents uh, sustaining economic development or sustainable economic development that continues to provide opportunity and jobs in the future, uh, a sustainable, sustainable and healthy population growth, to which it's been very, uh, Danbury's population growth has been very consistent and sustainable in that way. So sustainability is a broad term, and, it, and I think it's most obviously expressed with respect to your open space and environmental resources. Uh, so we're, we're going to get into that. It's woven throughout, and it isn't just one thing. Uh, so I want to impress that upon you. We're going to be revisit, revisiting this term quite a bit uh, throughout the plan. So let's talk about how uh, the city's land use has changed over a roughly 30-year period. And, and the maps and, and the data that I'm presenting here 
comes from a, a, a really good project uh, conducted by UConn and the state. Um, and that is a, a very thorough land cover assessment of the entire state. And uh, they studied uh, aer aerial photographs in detail of how the state, in this case, Danbury looked in 1985, and then again in 2015 and then went back and compared the differences and figured out how land use and land cover changed over that 30 year period. Uh, all of the areas that you see in red on the map are areas that were developed or the land use was intensified or changed over that period. Um, and that includes, and I've labeled just a few of the larger uh, properties, Danbury Fair Mall, um, which is less was less than 30 years old as of 2015. Sterling Woods, villages at Timber Oak, Rivington. And what we see is the very Eastern part of Danbury and the, the Western part uh, experienced the most development and growth. Danbury Fair Mall is the old fairgrounds, right? So that would have been mostly uh, turf and grass at uh, 30 plus years ago. When we take a look at the numbers, what we see is um, the, the, our biggest changes here were really uh, with respect to forest. And, and so when we take a look at your land cover right now, you have roughly about the same amount of developed area as you do forest, which uh, is very healthy for a city. You have a lot of forest for a city. Um, all the other uh, land, co land covers or land uses are, are a, a lot less. So you, you have a, a really interesting dichotomy in, at Danbury in that you have a downtown that's fairly intensely developed and some very developed areas, but you're surrounded by a tremendous amount of forest, including deciduous forest, coniferous forest. And of course you have large water areas and those are all uh, shown in, in the chart there. And once again, this comes from all the same research that was done by, by UConn. Now, when we take a look at that change, uh, Essentially, what was traded for developed land was forest. Uh, most of the areas developed were forested. And, um, and so there's over that 30 year period, uh, over about 1300 acres of forest land was developed and you had about 1600 acres of development, which is about 5% of Danbury. Um, and over a 30 year period developing 5% of your city's area, it, it's it's fairly conservative development. Um, regardless, this is something we wanna be mindful of as we are planning for the next 10 years or more within the POCD. So the four, as I mentioned, the forest land cover, it's uh, all the gray areas where you're highly developed and that's mostly in the core of Danbury and intense forest areas in Southern and Northern uh, parts of the city. And there are all the, the numbers on that there. Uh, shifting gears a little bit to water quality and all of that forest area I just showed you is really uh, instrumental to uh, preserving water quality. Uh, Danbury has very good water quality throughout the city. Uh, these ratings here are uh, uh, water quality ratings are rated by Connecticut Deep and they maintain the, the database on this. And what we see is the A and A, it's, it's like grades in school, right? A and AA is better. Uh, AA are typically public water uh, source sources. Um, the extra A denotes that. Um, and class B are a lower standard. Um, and they're a lower standard in that the expectation for the water quality is lower. It, it's not because of the nature of the development around that area and what's contributing to the water, in this case, the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, it, it's not held to the same standard or expectation. It's graded a B and that's the level of expectation. And so what we see is in the lower parts of the Still River in the Eastern part uh, of the city, uh, we have B and, and that's, uh, there are a few reasons for that. And as we get to the watershed map, I'll be able to explain that in a little more detail. And if you're interested, I'm not gonna read all these now, but we wanted to make sure the information was available to you. These are the water quality classes and grades that uh, for water qualities that you have here in Danbury. And, and this is basically what it means. 
uh, you know, A is better and, and B is, is, is not as good. Uh, there are, uh, there is an impaired class. So the B with the asterisks or ending with an asterisk or noted as impaired means that it is not uh, achieving the benchmark that is established for it. So B is a certain level of quality that is expected. And if there's an asterisk, it means it, it's not achieving. Okay, uh, so the city and, and most of the city is within a much larger uh, watershed of course, and that's the Still River watershed. And the Still River watershed is, this is like the Russian dolls that fit in, in each other. The Still River watershed is part of the Housatonic River watershed. And that's the map in the upper left corner that is a little difficult to read. The darkest blue area is the Still River, which you see in the larger map. And the lighter blue area, which spans into New York and all the way up to Massachusetts uh, and, and all as nor far north as Vermont, uh, is the Housatonic River watershed. So these all feed into each other. The Still River watershed uh, is the southwest corner of the Housatonic River watershed. Uh, so everything in Danbury is pretty much, with the exception of northwest corner of the city, and I'll show you that in the next slide, it's pretty much flowing east and north. Uh, so the Still River, which is receiving most of your waters, is about 25 miles in, in length, and uh, it, it, flows, it flows north up. Uh, up into Brookfield and to New Milford. The Still River does have a watershed plan. Um, the watershed plan was uh, prepared by the Houstonic Valley Association. And that plan uh, makes a series of recommendations for the entire watershed and some that are specific to uh, Danbury. And uh, by example, it, uh, it recommends establishment of vegetated buffers at Lake Kenosha, public campaign for litter reduction, uh, implementation of best management practices, uh, continued maintenance of the MS4 permit program. I'll get into what that is in a little bit. And then specific measures like reducing impervious surface, establishing riparian buffer buffers using rain barrels, rain gardens, uh, and some stormwater measures as well. And there are a number of specific sites where the plan uh, recommends improvements within Danbury uh, just to provide illustrations for what could be done. Now, um, going into a little more detail about the city's drainage basins. And so a basin is a, a constituent part of a watershed. And the Still River watershed is comprised of multiple basins. And that includes, uh, they're all listed there, uh, Boggs Pond Brook and East Swamp Brook and, and a bunch of others. Basically, those all flow uh, east and north. Um, everything in the other basins uh, flows really uh, outside of Danbury and not into the Still River Basin. So the Saugatuck River Basin is flowing south. Uh, it's not flowing into the Still River watershed. The Croton uh, River and Quarter and Pond Brook Basins, basins in the northwest corner flow northwest and those are headed to New York. And the Lake Candlewood Basin is really, it's mostly flowing into Lake Candlewood and then flowing north out of Lake Candlewood. So what, what you see is the way your water's moving, it, it, it's really moving for most of the city, it's moving uh, to the east and, and eventually to the north. And as, as we get into where your watershed is located and talk about where your wastewater treatment plant is, it'll be a little more obvious as to why your uh, water resources are where they are and why the wastewater treatment plant is where, where it is. Uh, but let's talk about flood zones because they are associated with those basins and, and with your water bodies. And, and I think it's probably something that we, got, we had a reminder uh, just a few weeks ago about uh, how important this issue is. Um, flood zones are, are delineated by FEMA uh, and they're broken into a bunch of different classes, but the two main groups are 100 year and 500 year. And those are somewhat misnomers. 100 year just means there's a 1% annual chance and 500 year means there's a 0.2% 
annual chance of flooding. And I think the experience has been is that it's been more frequent than the 100 year or 500 year period. And uh, Jen, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the recent flooding we had was was very close to the uh, 100 year uh, flood marks in a lot of locations, is that correct? That is correct. I think it wasn't quite, from what I understand, it wasn't, wasn't yeah. quite the 100 year, but it, it, it was pretty close. Right, okay. All right, so um, the, the dark blue areas in the map show where that 100 year floodplain is. And what you can see is that the Danbury Mall airport area it is a very large floodplain area. And, and you also have uh, to the east in the area of uh, Home Depot, and you'll see the picture in a minute. Uh, uh, you have some areas, uh, pretty si significant areas associated with the Still River. All right, and there's the picture right there. Uh, the flooding from just a few weeks ago, Jen took that, that picture and uh, so what we see is that uh, this is not an unusual occurrence and there are uh, multiple, what we call repetitive loss properties in that they flood on a, a regular basis or have flooded on multiple uh, events and have sustained some sort of flooding, flood impact or damage from those flood events. Now, uh, many of those properties were built before uh, Section 7A of the city's zoning regulations, which are the city's floodplain regulations. And so they, uh, they did not have protective measures in place. So there are new standards that now are applied uh, to development. And, and an example would be Whole Foods, where there were some floodplain protection measures put in place, including the provision of uh, a compensatory floodplain where areas of floodplain were were improved upon that prevent flooding. So that in the case of Whole Foods has been successful in the, in the case of the Toyota dealership across the street from the Home Depot, uh, not so where they, they built in the floodplain uh, without benefit of the, the flood uh, plain regulations being enforced upon that property. Uh, <clears throat> stormwater management, of course, uh, this is all related uh, to storm, stormwater, uh, you know, flooding really results from water having no place to go and the stormwater system being overwhelmed, including the, the natural rivers that, that uh, distribute the water. Uh, the state requires that the city through its MS4 permit um, take measures necessary to protect water quality. And that is basically uh, good governance and management of their stormwater system. And, and case of the city, it's basically DPW's responsibility uh, to maintain and manage that system. And that includes a, a plan that was put in place and annual reporting and, and a bunch of other work they do. Uh, the plan itself has six elements. They're all listed there and they range from public education to monitoring to uh, physical improvements of the system. When we take a, a look at the city, and its stormwater system, uh, what we see is the, the yellow areas are um, what's called an urbanized area. And that's, that's based upon census uh, data and at certain densities, you get over a certain density of population uh, by, I think it's by a census track or block group, and it becomes designated a census tract or an urbanized area. And, and that is one of the factors that goes into the stormwater management plan and where it's applicable. Uh, the other factor is impervious cover. So if you have impervious cover greater than 11%, we're talking about parking lots and roads and rooftops, that mm -hmm. sort of thing, then it's also subject to regulation through the permit program. Um, so within that area, there are certain priority areas that are established. And uh, where the, the city uh, has to take some other measures to uh, minimize stormwater impact and improve water quality. Uh, so getting into that, um, what we see is that, uh, first of all, 75% of the city is urbanized area. And um, that has uh, resulted in a delineation of uh, several water bodies 
in the city as impaired waters. And basically what that means is because of the surrounding land uses, uh, that the water quality is not expected to uh, meet certain standards for habitat. Uh, and all of this is, has been documented in the stormwater management plan. And so what we want to do is we want to comb through that plan and make sure the POCD is providing recommendations that are supportive of what needs to be done to protect water quality and help the city and the DPW comply with uh, their MS4 permit requirements. Uh, one other uh, item, uh, and I, uh, we included this because I think we we're just impressed by the number of different water bodies there are in the city. Uh, the city has 53 different named water bodies. Uh, most of these are brooks and some rivers, lakes, ponds, that sort of thing. But there's 53 in total. So I, I wanted to get in there, this in there just to impress upon you the environmental resources that you have in the city. And this comes out of the stormwater management plan. Okay, um, shifting gears a little bit, let's talk about groundwater quality and then we'll get into um, talking about your, your water or drinking water supplies and resources. Uh, so at, as I think as you all understand that the city not only does it have water on top of it, there's water permeating the ground throughout and much of that water is used uh, as drinking water, whether for private wells or for public water supply. And uh, the quality of those reservoirs has been rated by the state. Um, and that's from a combination of testing and also taking a look at land uses that are on top of those areas. And the state provides its assessment and very similar to uh, surface water, um, it's the same kind of rating scale with the A's being better and the B's being a lower or lower quality or lower expected quality. And, and what we see is there are some wells that are designated as impaired, meaning they're not achieving the, uh, the grade level that's expected, in this case, the GAA, which means highest standard in public water supply. And the city is actively working towards uh, identifying, correcting the issues that are uh, contributing to that impairment. So this is very much front and center. Um, and I think what's become clear is that the POCD definitely needs to prioritize uh, the protection of water quality and the provision of adequate water supply for the city. And so I expect that's a conversation that we'll come back to and how that's done, what needs to be done, what kind of resources the city needs, what, what areas need to be better protected, that sort of thing. And there, there's all the information as to how that score, and this is very similar to surface water, how, how those ratings are scored. Okay, so your drinking water resources. Um, almost entirely in the northwest corner of the city, associated with um, the watersheds for Waste Lake, uh, West Lake Reservoir, uh, East Lake Reservoir, and Marjorie Lake Reservoir, and in addition to that, Lake Kenosha, and the there and the aquifer protection area around Lake Kenosha. So let me pull this apart a little bit. The dark blue areas all match up with drainage basins I showed you on a, on a prior map. And um, those areas drain into or feed uh, your reservoirs, West Lake, Marjorie, and East Lake, or brooks and rivers that feed into those reservoirs. Uh, in addition to Lake Kenosha, which is an emergency resource for maintaining water supply. Uh, so all these areas are uphill and to the west. And your wastewater treatment plant is at the far uh, eastern part of the city and downhill. And, and so that, that's the correlation here between your, which way your water flows. So you, you, with the idea is you take your water from the uphill parts where it's, it's more pristine, there's less flowing into it, and you discharge it at the lowest part for as far away as, as possible. Um, the Lake Kenosha area is also an aquifer protection area. Uh, and that is a aquifer protection area is something delineated by the state. And that is basically a shallow aquifer, usually sand and gravel aquifer where you have a public water supply that's being extracted from it. 
So the state has developed a program uh, with certain mandates and restrictions on land use in that area. And that's something that uh, the, the city's responsible for uh, managing and administering. Uh, so the Lake Kenosha area is, is really important to the water supply because uh, there are uh, drinking water wells there that are used um, to help maintain water levels in the city's reservoirs. And because on an emergency basis, Lake Kenosha has in the past, uh, the city's performed what's called flood skimming on the lake. And that is when you have excess water levels in the lake, drawing some of that off and pumping it into reservoirs. And that it, uh, can be an important uh, uh, resource during uh, drought periods. So a little more on the aquifer protection area, and there's a closer up map. Um, it spans developed areas. It's, uh, it's underneath Kenosha Park, across 84, across the rail tracks, 202, up into the Mill Plain area. Uh, and so there's a lot of development in this area, and, and that's the challenge of uh, maintaining a shallow, uh, uh, a sh what is a relatively shallow aquifer, the water quality within it. Um, the, uh, and I should note that the Lake uh, Kenosha Aquifer Protection Area, uh, there are regulations within the city's uh, zoning uh, regulations, and the city also has an aquifer protection agency that is staffed by members of the uh, Planning Commission. Wetlands. Um, at, at this point, I, I want to turn it over to, to Anthony to talk about uh, some of these environmental resources and why they're significant to your local environment and habitat. And, and first, let me say the wetlands are a really important part of your drinking water and particularly your groundwater and aquifer water because they filter your water. And, and so they're an incredibly important part of the ecosystem. And uh, with that being said, I, I'll, I'll turn it over to Anthony to, to talk a little bit about the role and the function they play, particularly as related to habitat. I had to unmute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Thanks, Francisco. Uh, I think Francisco did an excellent job uh, covering, um, you know, uh, all the resources that are kind of related and leading up to uh, the discussion of wetlands. Um, you know, there are, there are different types of wetlands uh, and by types, I mean cover types, right? You, so he, in that pie chart, he showed you that you have forested wetlands. You also have um, non-forested wetlands. And then in the middle, you have woody wetlands that are not forested. So those are called the scrub shrub wetlands, right? And then uh, those describe wetlands. And then you have water bodies, which are your lakes and ponds, and then water courses, which are your rivers and streams and brooks. And so in, um, in, in some systems, you have uh, multiple resources that all uh, work together to, to provide uh, the ecological functions and values of the system. And the uses vary, right? And so for Candlewood Lake, we see it has very high recreational use, right? Whereas some of the um, wetland forested wetland systems in the highland areas in undeveloped portions of the city, um, the recreational use may not be as high, um, but biodiversity may be high. Um, but in the same token, those same wetlands, uh, as Francisco alluded to, are providing other ecosystem services as, as well. And so they're, they're, they're feeding uh, the downstream water bodies at, at a regulated pace so that um, when you have large precipitation events, it's uh, all rushing down slope at one time. Uh, causing downstream flooding. Uh, those wetlands are acting as big sponges, soaking up all that precipitation and then slowly uh, uh, bleeding it out in a sustainable way uh, through the watercourse systems down to the uh, lower portions of the watershed. So uh, you can see from this map here in those, those highland regions that um, Francisco talked about in the northwest corner of the city and in the southwest corner, those highland regions uh, are dotted with these different types of, of wetland systems that are, are providing that function. So very important in terms of 
uh, the human aspect, but also in terms of um, creating diverse habitats within those forested lands, within those highland regions, um, uh, and therefore an important component of the biodiversity. Um, and there's a number of laws that um, protect those wetland and watercourse resources um, in recognition of that. And so it's not just the animals that benefit from these wetlands, it's, it's humans as well. And therefore we have, you know, city inland wetlands, municipal wetland regulations, we have um, state resources uh, and federal resources as well. So three layers of regulation that apply. Um, oftentimes um, those um, regulatory limits of those wetlands are the same, but sometimes they differ. And so for instance, the state of Connecticut recognizes uh, floodplain and alluvial soils as wetlands as well even if they're not hydric. And so you may have different um, regulatory limits along say the Still River in areas where there's big floodplain develop, uh, natural floodplain development. Okay. Yeah, let's go to the soils map next so we can talk about that. Uh, excuse me, should I move that last map? Yeah, Joel, go ahead, yep. Um, can you bring that back up? Yep. There we go. Um, I, I just, I'm curious, uh, where I live, there's a lot of high elevation wetlands um, up on you know, the Pine Mountain area, Spruce Mountain area. And uh, you know, I've spent my younger years hiking all through there, and uh, it's pretty easy to find a bog that you uh, can't hardly walk out of. But uh, I, I just don't see that on the map. Maybe the little bit of specks along the southern portion of the, uh, the map uh, that you can't discern a color. Uh, I, I'm just asking, are, are those consistent? Yeah, I'll take the first stab at that, Anthony. If, if I don't get it right, feel free to win. Yeah, I, you know, I had trouble hearing Joel. I, did anybody else? Yeah, he's basically saying yeah, you he, you know, his, his experience was that there's a lot of uh, small wetlands up in the Highlands area, and he's not doesn't feel like he's seeing them all on the map. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I would say to that is we, you know, we're working with a uh, state level data and it's not picking up everything that's out there. And, and those typically, it, it, by example, if you had a development application coming before you for, I don't know, a, a dozen acres in, in that general area, forested area, there would have to have to be a delineation take place. Uh, someone would have to go out and walk the area, uh, identify plant species and, and findings, and actually delineate the wetlands, in which case they would show up on the map. And so a lot of the areas are there, but they're just not delineated. And Anthony, right. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add. No, that's a that's perfect uh, response, Francisco. And, you know, so when, when we're dealing with the landscape level mapping exercises, you know, we're, we're, we're pulling from either existing maps uh, on a municipal level, on a state level, or or sometimes uh, both, and then also there's there's federal mapping too. There's what's called the National Wetlands Inventory, which some time ago uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife decided through analysis of aerial imagery and and um, soils mapping that they would delineate uh, wetland areas. But oftentimes these are only good down to like perhaps like a two acre resolution, um, if if that, and so. And that's exactly like what Francisco said. That's why you have to have a wetland delineation done if you're going to develop a property, because none of these mapping sources depict all the resources that are actually out there. And, and so at you know such, such a, a small scale as this map here, it may not depict all those resources. But if, if you were to zoom in and get any one given area um, in real life and look down on the ground, you may have even more multiple little uh, interconnecting wetlands here and there. I, I suspect what's shown here for watercourses are probably perennial watercourses, uh, meaning they flow, you know, all, all year long or nearly all year long. And probably what's not shown are all the smaller intermittent watercourses that flow for maybe only uh, one or two months out of the year, or, or maybe during, um, you know, larger uh, rainfall events. So th those are regulated as well. And, and the way this use, this information, this mapping is useful to us 
is that uh, we may, uh, as course of this plan, make recommendations for uh, you know additional conservation of land or acquisition of land or additional protections on land because of the natural resources that are present. And by, by knowing where all those resources are, where they're concentrated, it would better inform those types of recommendations. I think Perry had a question too. Yeah, Perry, go ahead. I just discovered a new feature of Zoom where if you raise your shoulder, it automatically raises your hand. So I was not raising my hand. I apologize for that. <laughs> really? Oh, wow. Okay. That's, that's a little scary, actually. <laughs> when you might have seen me raise my hand, I was testing it afterwards to see why yeah. that happened. That's, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> the, the next feature will be you think about raising your hand and it yeah, yeah. raises your hand. Amen. All right. Um, <laughs> So we still have quite a bit of material to get through. So let's go on. Anthony just started talking about soils and how they factor in. So Anthony, take it away. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's, it's important to know uh, about your soil types because again, um, in Connecticut, anything uh, that it, with a soil type that's classified the Natural Resource Conservation Service as poorly drained and very poorly drained soils, are the, those are going to be hydric. And so those soils are regulated as wetlands. The area, areas underlain by those soils are regulated as wetlands by, um, by the US Army Corps of Engineers. And then, as I mentioned, in addition to that, in Connecticut, Connecticut recognizes alluvial and floodplain soils as uh, wetlands as well, even if the soils are not hydric. And so, in other words, you could have very dry soils um, that were uh, created by the deposition of, of river material, uh, but they're regulated as wetlands in Connecticut as alluvial and floodplain soils. And so oftentimes um, some of these uh, alluvial and floodplain soils are important for agriculture too, because they have the right uh, soil texture for growing crops. Um, floods bring in uh, new soil material, so therefore new nutrients come in, so this, these soils do not get depleted as, as they're being uh, used for agricultural purposes um, and you know you're gonna worry about uh, all the other uh, human uses of soils um, you're not going to want to be putting septic systems in, into poorly drained and very poorly drained soils because they just won't function properly um, and um, and then on the other side of the coin uh, away from wastewater for drinking water uh, some types of uh, alluvial soils are very good um, at serving as uh, water resources through wells, very productive for wells. So for instance, um, you know, gravel, gravel, gravel sources, uh, um, you know, they have high porosity, water moves pretty quickly. Um, so the, the, the production wells um, uh, generate a lot of water in a quick, quick amount of time. Okay. Um, and then topography. And so, and topography is important, um, again, because it's just another uh, part of the puzzle when, uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, ecosystem services and, and how humans benefit from that, right? So your, your steepest slopes are going to be the ones that uh, tend to have the highest runoff. And so um, you want to maintain dense vegetation cover there because um, it, the roots hold the soils together, protect the slope from failure. Uh, the tree canopy breaks the force of the rain falling so that it's not hitting directly on soil particles and dislodging them. Uh, you want to try and either discourage development from the steepest slopes or um, kind of uh, strictly regulate development on moderately st steep slopes. And then um, from a biodiversity point of view, uh, you look at um, places like um, Candlewood Lake that has some really steep slopes up by Bear Mountain State Park, in that area uh, on the western shore of Candlewood. Um, and those, those are going to be densely uh, forested slopes that are, are going to protect that shoreline, um, keep, keep um, water quality, uh, ma maintaining water quality because you won't have um, the turbidity events um, if, if that was to lose its, its forest cover and, and be subjected to erosion and sedimentation. Uh, if you do look down at the southern part of the city, you see that you have a number of, of north-south trending slopes together, right? And so 
in between those slopes, you have these cool ravines down in those valleys. And so there, there are likely to be a number of rare species occurring in those ravines because the, the, that microclimate is probably more indicate, in, indicative of what you would find in uh, northern New England than you would in southern New England. And so, and you overlay that on top of um, limestone uh, bedrock and what we have, what's called algific slopes, which are, are hotbeds of biodiversity in rare species. So uh, that information is, is extremely important to know uh, when you're um, you know, assessing uh, an inventory of your resources on a landscape level. Next slide. So all this translates into habitats. You put it all together, your soil types, your, your water resources, your slopes, your, your um, forest blocks. And um, you, you, you can start, once you start overlaying them, you can start to see uh, that those areas become hotspots of biodiversity. And that, that, that rings true and plays out when looking at uh, the natural diversity database maintained by the Connecticut DEP. Those little round bubbles of um, tan coloration there uh, uh, and polygons are known locations that support um, species that are listed on Connecticut's a list of endangered, threatened, and special concern species. And those species, again, are, are protected by state law. Uh, and they if and they also contain uh, the the state endangered species act also contains uh, federal species that are listed as well. So anything that's federally listed is automatically on the on the state list. Uh, the state list has more species than the federal list because uh, it's talking about things that are rare right in the state of Connecticut, right? And so you're going to have more state species than you are federal. Um, so every one of those little tan areas represents the known location. Uh, of a rare species. And you see that uh, as I'm talking, that southern part of the, of the city uh, with those um, north-south trending ridgelines and cool ravines uh, has a high propensity and, and high known uh, density of, of uh, rare species. Again, the Candlewood Lake area and uh, um, the outer limits, the northwest and, and southwest corner of the city. So, um, the, so the, there are a number of regional uh, conservation plans uh, that um, different groups have um, taken the initiative um, uh, to, um, uh, to promote. And uh, Danbury Falls within a number of these, these different um, regional conservation plans, uh, you know, a big one being the, the Hudson, the Housatonic uh, Regional Conservation Partnership. Um, so all the lands in between the Hudson River and the Housatonic River, trying to link up habitats within the different municipalities. So you're not just looking at it in tunnel vision of just your, your, your municipality, but how your municipality fits into the greater landscape. Uh, so you can kind of maintain gene flow of, of, of species, biodiversity and species from one municipality to the other. Um, and then a good example of that is the pollinator uh, pathway. And um, it, it's an initiative where a number of, of different uh, towns tried to promote uh, these different um, stopover habitats for pollinators that are moving on the wing. A lot of people uh, don't realize that um, it's not just birds that migrate, but it's a lot of insects as well. Butterflies do, dragonflies do. Uh, so you get movement of uh, invertebrates as well as vertebrates um, and, and bats. Bats migrate as well. Um, not all of them, uh, some, spe some species, not all of them overwinter deep in caves. You have some that um, roost in treetops and then uh, they migrate just like birds. So by promoting this pollinator habitat, you're promoting the food that sustains uh, larger migrations of um, vertebrate animals. And so you know, this is just one conservation initiative that um, uh, uh, elucidates uh, the issue of trying to maintain habitat connectivity on a larger scale. Okay, um, and and by you know being connected uh, on a larger scale and looking at what's going on in the, in the in the region, 
um, you, you'll be able to identify threats um, before they even come to your town. And so, you know, we all know that um, our towns, uh, no matter where you go in Connecticut, you, you can uh, pretty much expect to come across invasive species uh, on, on conservation lands. And so it's not a matter of, do you have invasive species? It's usually a matter of how prevalent are they and uh, are they a threat to our natural ecosystems? And so um, a number of uh, species uh, are in flux. Uh, some are moving into the state. Um, some have been here for such a long time that they've almost become naturalized into the landscape. Uh, some have, have been here um, for a long time and have caused uh, millions, if not billion dollars worth of damage uh, through loss of uh, timber and, and things like that um, and the spread of disease. And so um, we have a bunch of known invasive species already in the town, but um, more are probably to come. And so we'll, you'll, we'll, you'll want to look at that and be able to have what's called uh, the capacity for early detection and rapid response. Because usually it's, it's uh, if to do something uh, about it, um, you, ha you have to hit it early and hit it hard uh, to be effective. And it, if you wait too long before things get established, then it becomes almost impossible to control. And, and as a reminder, the relevance here to our POCD is that uh, invasive species and pests such as uh, emerald ash borer, woolly adulgid, and, and some scarier potential threats like Asian longhorn beetle, uh, they could do some real damage to all of that forest area in Danbury. Um, and that forest area uh, protects your water quality. Uh, so there's, there's a direct correlation here. Um, and the city's resources are extremely limited with respect to forest management. That falls under DPW, the forestry division. And they're, they're mainly taking care of nuisance trees uh, fall over roads. Uh, they have very limited budget and resources to uh, monitor and track for some of these invasive species. And the city does not have a forest management plan, which, which very, very few uh, municipalities do have one. Uh, but you have a lot of forest and it plays an incredibly important role in uh, your drinking water quality and, uh, and in habitat and all these other things that we're discussing here. Uh, Absolutely. So, if, if you yeah. consider the, the whole Green Mountain uh, National Forest up in Vermont, that was established back in the 30s by the federal government, not because they wanted a place for recreation and hunting and things like that. It was because of all the massive floods uh, that um, if, if you think about it, um, you know, 100 years ago, uh, many parts of New England were completely deforested. And so when those major rains came, uh, that water just ran off quickly. And you had whole communities that were just wiped out by, by flooding downstream. And so uh, the federal government realized very early on that, you know, some of these higher slopes areas need, need to stay for, under forest cover. And really, so on a smaller scale, on, on a municipal scale here in Danbury, um, you're looking kind of like a similar situation where you want to keep your, your high ridge tops forested uh, to protect those slopes and also to, to send nice cool air that, that tends to sink uh, down into the city uh, down below, uh, especially on, on extremely hot summer days. Francisco, I, 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 I got to jump off, but I did just want to intervene here. I, I yeah. have thought this, this presentation has been extremely informative and very, very interesting. I do want to call to your attention that in the hazard mitigation planning, and perhaps you'll get to this. Yeah, we will. But go and, ahead. And, yeah. and uh, you know, kind of just jumping off what Anthony just said is specifically the downtown area and the urban area is in need of a shading and cooling strategy. And this has been brought to our attention. Uh, and I'd like to at least have some conversation around this, perhaps not now, but as we look at our planning, Sharon. We ought to be looking at this, um, you know, in the future. And again, perhaps you've you've addressed this, Francisco, but a cooling and shading strategy for the downtown area is in need. It's been brought to our attention, okay. and I'd like to see as a parallel process this conversation, you know, you know, bring that into the discussion. Yeah, gladly. And and that specifically has not been come up as an issue as of yet, but I. I it, it's very relevant, particularly in the age of warm, much hotter summers. 
and and uh, yeah, and it's an environmental justice issue as well. So, thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks, man. All right, Anthony, I think this is uh, your last slide. Yeah. Okay. Well, just just to show you. Um, when we talked about the that Connecticut's in, Endangered Species Act and the, the endangered, threatened, and special concern species that are on that list, if you look at just Fairfield County, um, the, you, know, you have the state list, and then you have the state list that are broken down by county. You know, um, in Fairfield County, six mammals, forty-two birds, fourteen reptiles, three fish, four amphibians, twenty-nine invertebrates, and eight plant species. That uh, eight. Uh, it's got to be more than eight, Francisco. Not sure what happened there. Uh, well, it doesn't include subspecies, different groups. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, there, there, there are a lot of um, species um, that are within your purview in Fairfield County, and you know, and 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 Danbury shares, you know, the role in in protect protection of those species, and and as I mentioned, you know, um, they are they are protected by law. So you know, you would want to, you know, the best thing is to kind of steer the most intensive development away from those areas um, and, and may perhaps look for alternatives, redevelopment of brownfields or reuse of, of existing development, pro developed property, things like that. Um, but when you are in, in sensitive areas, there, there's a way to implement these developments uh, in, in a way that you can either avoid or minimize or mitigate the impact to these species. And it's, 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 it's worth noting. Um, it's, uh, it, it can, um, prevent you from uh, uh, having um, unforeseen uh, constraints on your uh, construction or development project later on. Um, and it's, and it's the right ethical thing to do. All right. Thank you. Okay. So I, I want to uh, take a step back now and talk about uh, some of your functional open space. Uh, we've, been talking about your environmental resources and that, that's not always directly aligned with what uh, the city's open space or state open space within the city. Uh, the city does have over 1600 acres of municipally owned open space. That uh, includes 21 parks and playgrounds. Uh, there's also Worcester Mountain State Park in addition, which is on top of the, that acreage. And uh, furthermore, the Candlewood Valley Regional Trust owns 70 properties in Danbury. Uh, so those are all different types and functions of open space. Not all of them provide uh, a significant environmental contribution. Uh, small playgrounds aren't, uh, you know, Richter Municipal Golf Course is not really a habitat uh, in that way. It's primarily a recreational facility. Um, but they, they all play a role and they have, uh, a, you know, capacity to provide an environmental benefit to the city. Um, when we take a look at how all of these spaces are managed, um, uh, what we see is that there are a lot of different players. Uh, so uh, just to take a look at a few, um, we have different, the city, it's, it's interesting, it has different authorities that have been established. So these properties aren't managed directly by the, by the city, but rather an authority was created that is financed by the city with, you know, a, a, a oversight board and, and a staff. And that includes Candlewood Lake, which of course is a regional authority or, or kind of a partner authority. Uh, Lake Kenosha, Terrywall Park, Bear Mountain Reservation. Um, these are all assets that are managed by the city or authority. Uh, Farrington Woods is a property that was acquired by the city in 2010. And there are multiple other parks and, and properties on, on the list, but these are some of the notable ones. And I, I wanna talk in a little bit more detail about uh, the top three, Candlewood Lake, Lake Kenosha and Terrywall Park because of the authorities that were established um, to manage those resources. So Candlewood Lake, I, I think you're, I imagine you're all very familiar with the lake. It, uh, you know, it spans multiple municipalities and uh, was established, uh, the authority was established a long time ago. The lake itself is owned by First Light, which generates power from the lake. 
uh, they they uh, provide a, a small contribution to the funding of the authority. Uh, there was a formula created a long time ago. Uh, all the towns pay uh, or make a contribution towards uh, the authority and its operation. And the authority is has a, a, a huge, uh, a tremendous uh, a task or responsibility for uh, doing all kinds of work, in, including policing the lake, doing outreach and communications, managing. Uh, so this is really a regional and almost a, a state level resource that's being uh, uh, managed by an authority that's financed by five municipalities. So it, it's a huge asset um, and it's, it's really, it's under-resourced if, if anything. Um, and when I say it's a huge asset, it's got 65 miles of shoreline, uh, uh, eight plus miles of surface area um, and it's 11 miles long and about two miles wide. Lake Kenosha is very different. It, it's a much smaller lake entirely within Danbury. I talked a little bit uh, earlier about the valuable role that this plays in uh, Danbury's water supplies, emergency resource, and uh, really as, as kind of the surface waters of the aquifer that's below it. Uh, the area, as you can see in this aerial photo, there's some pretty intense development around it. The Lake Kenosha Park on, on the north side of, of the lake. Uh, and so maintaining a water quality here is, is going to be incredibly important. The Lake Kenosha Commission uh, has a, a, this is not, this is dissimilar from uh, the authorities, the Terry Wall Park Authority or Candlewood Authority in that it is a, a much, it doesn't have any staff. It has a tiny stipend every year. And, and I'm not sure how active the commission actually is, um, but the uh, stewardship of this lake will continue to be really important to Danbury's water supply. Terry Wall Park, on the other hand, uh, is a much, much larger resource with a very active park authority. Uh, so there are 70, 722 acres in total, and most of those comprised of naturalized areas, meadows, forests, mountains, lakes, ponds. Uh, was, the initial purchase was uh, conducted in 1985 by the city, and, and the city's acquired multiple properties since. And of course, it's managed by the Park Authority, which has um, a, a very, very small staff and a, a budget that uh, I am told is, is, is really, um, uh, challenging uh, to meet uh, all the needs of managing the park with the budget they have. Uh, the authority does do fundraising. There is a friends group that helps with fundraising um, and, and it is relying upon uh, volunteer uh, assistance as well. All right, so when we, when we zoom out, we take a look at all the different entities involved in, in stewardship and management of the city's open space and natural resources, um, there are a lot of puzzle pieces or, or moving parts here. On one side, you have um, all of the commissions and agencies, and um, uh, some of this is gonna come down to, you know, what, where should you put it and what color should it be? But I tried, tried to carve this up logically. So on one side, you have all the city's commissions and agencies that are have a purview or responsible for the, the city as a whole. And on the other side, you have these commissions and authorities that are set up and they have responsibilities that are fixed to a geography. Um, and then of course, overseeing all of that and is are the city departments, planning and zoning, health and human services and, and DPW. And so we'll, we'll get into a little bit more detail about all the responsibilities. Uh, so the city commissions and agencies, you have a conservation commission uh, and their purview is, is really to look for lands that the city could or should uh, acquire or, or receive as part of a donation. Uh, and, and so I expect that um, this is a conversation we're gonna wanna have as to whether or not there are any lands uh, that should be recommended for acquisition or for donation, targeted for some sort of donation. The Environmental Impact Commission, 
which is the city's inland and watercourse uh, regulation agency. And, and so they enforce or administer uh, uh, those regulations. Uh, your planning commission, which um, reviews applications uh, for your, uh, that come before it for developments and, and basically uh, stipulates and makes sure the requirements of your zoning and, and all the, all the um, specific areas of your zoning, like uh, you know, watershed protection, aquifer protection, floodplain protection are, are met. Uh, the Zoning Con Commission, which really authors uh, those regulations and updates and make changes to the map uh, and approves special permits. And the Aquifer Protection Agency, which is uh, a comprised of members of the Planning Commission, which it is really it ensures compliance with the state's aquifer protection requirements around Lake Kenosha. And then uh, when we take a look at um, city departments and, and really these are the, the departments that play the primary role, right? The city as a whole, every, everyone is contributing in some way to uh, stewardship and management of the city's open space environmental resources. But these three departments play the, the most prominent role uh, with, with public uh, works do, uh, doing uh, a lot of the work in this area. Uh, they maintain the city's parks. Uh, they manage, uh, plant manage and remove city trees. They administer the stormwater management plan and, and MS4 permit requirements, maintain stormwater infrastructure. Uh, they operate your wastewater facility and infrastructure, drinking water facility infrastructure, conduct annual water quality testing and, uh, and then a whole bunch of other responsibilities related to open space and environmental resources, health and human services. Uh, you know, they respond to environmental complaints. They test uh, drinking water, inspect drinking water wells. Uh, and the planning zoning department, which oversees citywide plans like this one, uh, other planning efforts, um, you know, administers the city zoning regulations, staffs the boards and commissions, uh, prepares the annual capital improvement plan. Uh, so uh, I think what we're trying to impress upon you here, and I've got one more list to go through, is that uh, we should probably take an opportunity to make sure that uh, all of these, that these various entities are organized in the most productive and efficient way. And um, it, to make sure that this is working for the city, and to see if there are opportunities to streamline things or, or to uh, organize things that, so that um, stewardship is more effective in the city and that uh, every dollar goes a lot further. So finally, and I talked about these authorities already, uh, you know, Terry, Wild, uh, Terry Wild Park, Lake Kenosha, Candlewood Lake Authority. And, and I, I didn't note earlier, it's still a River Alliance Commission um, which uh, is responsible for um, the Still River uh, Greenway. And that, uh, as a greenway in itself, it's not a property or a parcel, rather it, it weaves through a lot of different uh, properties and, and parcels, but uh, greenways are uh, in incredibly valuable to exposing people to uh, in natural resources and environments. And by doing so, encouraging and promoting stewardship and public awareness of your environmental resources. And uh, uh, another resource not on this list, and I, I had a slide for it, but I, I think I, I would like, to, I, I'm holding it off until our next meeting where we talk about facilities would be the Ives Trail and that organization, uh, which is if not unlike the Still River uh, Alliance. So um, that, uh, that concludes our presentation of your open space environmental resources. And before we go on to kind of letting you know where we're at with respect to our schedule and, and what's next, I, I want to open it up to any questions or comments as to um, what you feel the city's uh, environmental and open space and sustainability needs are. And, I'm gonna do my best to type as I go. I, I tried to do it at our meeting last month and I couldn't get it to work, but uh, there, it's working this, 
this month. So go for it. I'll open up the floor to whoever wants to contribute. Well, we already have one, right? Because they said um, uh, urban cooling. Yeah, right. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll write that in right now. So it's, uh, it's downtown cooling and, and shading strategy. Yeah, Fran Francisco, Sharon, I just also wanted to um, make sure that we note that a lot of um, uh, the maintenance of trails and things through these open space parcels are being done by volunteers of yeah. either yeah. commissions or just volunteers in general who, you know, uh, um, have a strong feeling about it. So um, I think we just need to rec we need to recognize that and be appreciative that we have, um, you know, yeah. that that um, that a group of volunteers, you know, take out and, and Ed down the line. So I know he can chime in. Um, you, you use their own equipment, go out and take care of, um, you know, keeping the trails as clean, clear as they can. But it, it, it is kind of an overwhelming task, I think. Yeah, the yeah. only thing I'd comment on is that um, uh, I made a note when we were talking about invasive species that we probably should not leave off uh, Japanese knotweed because that's a real problem, especially along the Still River corridor. Um, it's yeah, almost impossible to eradicate and it yeah. takes over anything it gets near. Right, right. Yeah, we, we just provided a, a few of the, the uh, most common ones as, as an example, but yeah, they're very, very much so, yeah. Um, Helen Hofstad, oh, Helen Hofstetter here. Um, I would just like to add while we're on invasive, invasive species that I believe you said that we're very under resourced in terms of identifying, you know, the progress, like the, what's coming in, what's going out. And um, so I had an idea that perhaps we could get, you know, civilian people of interest, like a sort of um, an army of, you know, a civilian army to kind of get together in an organized way to once once a I don't know once a quarter or something go out and check different areas. I, I don't know, you know, if if how much is going on uh, in that regard from uh, the state or you know the agricultural center or or in in Danbury. So um, just to augment um, the a number of uh, people who could yep. help help with that would be helpful maybe. Go ahead, Joel has his hand raised too. Joel, hope you're not garbled, let's see. I just had to move myself. Um, I have two things. You mentioned the um, story of the Greenway uh, and the organization that supports that. I, I haven't been able to go down there for- Joel, for, Joel, uh, can, uh, Joel, Joel, the audio is really bad. Can you try maybe moving away from the microphone just a little bit to see if that helps? Back to it. I'm going to go get a microphone and earphones. I'll come back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Come back to us. Yep. Paul Rotello. Yes, Paul. I think what I'm looking for in the sixth ward, anyway, is more robust uh, stormwater runoff management, uh, flood control, and maybe even exploring uh, permeable surfaces the new products that they have out. I'm not sure if they're really ready for parking lots and things like that because they do require some maintenance. But uh, Ben Chinesi and I, my partner in the uh, sixth ward on the council, run into complaints constantly of flooded basements, people living on the lower ends of areas that have had uh, mm. above them development where uh, you know uh, metered systems are not being maintained. Uh, water is 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 coming down the hill and, and flooding houses that had never been flooded before. Um, as we as we continue to develop the city, I think we need something a little bit more um, uh, technical to absorb some of these um, uh, to, to, uh, you know, so some of this runoff going beyond metered systems and ponds and things like that. And I just think that that's something we need to look at. We're talking about down downstream cooling and whatnot, capturing the water and, and, and naturally releasing it back into the system so that the downtown area doesn't flood, uh, something like that. And I, I'm just not sure if those if those products are ready yet, but it's something that I, I, I would be in favor of exploring. Thanks. Okay. 
I'm back if it helps. Yeah, Joel, go ahead. Okay. You can hear me okay now? Much better, much better. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> just two things. One was uh, the uh, Greenway, and uh, I haven't been able to uh, get down to the Greenway for a few years now, but uh, in the past, the organization that uh, does that work has done a magnificent job of keeping that thing cleaned up. The, the Still River Greenway? Yeah. 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 And uh, the other was uh, when you talked about open space, uh, is there going to be some opportunity for uh, individuals to suggest uh, areas of open or areas of space that might be uh, uh, conducive to acquiring as open space? Yeah, very, very much so. Um, let let me ask you this: It's my understanding that the Conservation Commission has not been uh, active in a little while. Is that correct? I understand they haven't met in a while. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, well, I mean, uh, let me just yeah, let me just yeah, say I did. I, yeah, I just talked. I talked to Kim um, recently, and it, they are at the moment kind of like looking on how to maintain what they have. I mean, we yeah. we've been um, trying to get. Uh, some trails maps to put together kind of a continuous trail through all the yep. properties and connect, see where there's missing pieces. Um, but um, in terms of this strategy and, and or recommendations, I mean, I don't think anything's been done since right. before the 2008 open space bond, okay. maybe something like that. So that, that creates a really good, or that, presents us with a really good opportunity to make some recommendations through the POCD for, for potential, you know, properties that, that should be targeted for, for conservation. And to the extent that, that you can provide us a list, Joel, that we could share with people and get input on, that would be uh, very helpful. Okay. Uh, in defense of the commission, uh, the conservation commission, it's very difficult to get people to, uh, willing to serve on these volunteer uh, authorities and commissions. Right. Yeah. Sharon, um, if I, I may. Yep, go ahead, Fred. Uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, uh, add a little bit more to what Paul had to say about the, the flooding situation that we have. First of all, in the downtown district, uh, whenever we have the storms that we just went through with six to seven, eight inches of rain, the flooding conditions uh, on, on the, in the Main Street area are very bad and down in the, the southern end of the city. And also on Federal Road, uh, in the area of the Home Depot, uh, Green Tree, Toyota, the, uh, the, Sto the Still River constantly will run over and throw anywhere from two to three feet of rain in that, uh, in that area. So. Uh, these are things that, that need to be taken care of, and I know the city is is uh, coming at, trying to come up with a study to get that done. So uh, that's important. Yeah, we do, Fred. We we are continuing, as you've heard at Antonio talk about at meetings, um, trying to address kind of the East Ditch and the whole the water issue um, associated downtown. Um, and on the downtown vein, I mean, I think it's also important. We're talking about open space. It's be, be hard to try to find a big park downtown, but I think we have to be cognizant of um, and, and try to find areas where there's a little more open space um, downtown, whether it gets built into a new development or whether, um, you know, we could strategize about, you know, different ways to, to do that. But um, I think people will be drawn to downtown um, if there's more areas where there's kind of a little more breathing room. I agree. And I'd like to expand on that a little bit. Danbury over many, many years uh, had a considerable urban forest as the roads in all the old photos I see were all tree lined. Now these were uh, trees that you know, could be up to 200 years at maturity, a heritage tree, as we call them, as you know. And over the last 100 years or so, they've been cut down because one of the largest liabilities the city has is people tripping and falling on our sidewalks. They don't exist together very well. 
I think mm -hmm. we need to get back to tree lining and find some way of uh, developing our sidewalks as you're doing downtown now and including our uh, tree lining of our city streets so that we can develop our, our urban forest again. Um, you know, it, every tree that comes down uh, has such an incredible impact yeah. on what the city looks like. And I think we need to move towards uh, an outcome of more trees downtown. Great point, you Tim. Know, yeah, and as you know, Tim, I mean, the specs for the phase one of this downtown sidewalk project, which um, if anybody wants to take a look, it's, it's nearing completion. I mean, it looks great, but we took really a lot of time on the species. We worked together, obviously, on that with the landscape architect, with the um, what species they were, how they would be planted, a root barrier system so that we would kind of, we, um, a, a bigger tree well, so that there was room to grow without breaking up a sidewalk and with root systems that are kind of forced to grow down versus in a lineal fashion. So um, we were really cognizant of that. And um, uh, it, it looks good. It's, you know, the, the canopy will take a while to get back. Um, but uh, those trees, as you know, were kind of past their, um, or at the end of their lifespan. Not an easy task. We don't have no. the physical space to do it as it once was done and right. plant conifers that are going to uh, become 100 feet high and 250 years old. So we have to think in a different direction as you're doing downtown. Anyone else? Anybody else? Joel, do you have your hand up again or is that? Uh, unmute, Joel. No, it was left over. I took it down. All right, just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, I would just, Perry speaking, would just reemphasize the Japanese knotwood, uh, knotweed comment. It, what I've seen the last two or three years in terms of proliferation, it's probably too late, but. I feel bad Joel hasn't been down to the Still River, or maybe it's better he hasn't because there's oh, certain areas what. that are yeah. impassable. Yeah. Sharon and Jen and I were down there last week, and that's exactly what I noticed was how pervasive they, that it was. And I haven't been down in two years, so who knows how bad it's gone. <laughs> that's, that's sad to hear. It Ed, is. Ed, did you want to add anything? You're muted. How's there. that? There. <laughs> um, now we actually did a lot of work on the Greenway with the knotweed this year, um, collaborating with HVA, and they have a summered stewardship program. And we um, we cleared a lot of it, and uh, but it's a constant. It grows an inch a day, so it takes uh, steady work to to keep the trail open if. If, for instance, the handicap section at the trailhead, if if we don't maintain that uh, aggressively, uh, it'll close the trail within a month or two. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a big challenge, and it it's very it spreads like wildfire, and it kills everything it comes in contact with, and uh, just a small fragment can reroute. Uh, so it's it's a real bad problem. Awful. Thanks, Ed. So, Francisco, can you add on to this list about a strategy for management and um, uh, related to all, all the organizations that are involved in this, in, in maintaining our, our and, um, and, you know, our open spaces and our, and our resources? Okay. Oops. Sharon, I've got a Sort of a, this is Rich Ginelli, um, more of a, a thought on, on making downtown a little bit friendlier to, to, to walking. In Manhattan, a lot of the commercial buildings have what I refer to as little pocket parks within their, their, their foundation or atrium. Uh, for outside, some have little table set up and enclosed, you know, it's sort of like a, an area. Some have it fixed up with waterfalls in the back and, and uh, it, it might be something 
that some, and I know these are more commercial buildings and our downtown is, is not so much commercial or a combination of commercial and residential, but if somebody with some creativity when future building could incorporate some of this area, little areas of pocket parks where people who are walking have a place to go and sit down, maybe have a little table if they want to have some coffee, you know, things like that. It, it's, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's practical here, but it's certainly, I know in Midtown when you're walking, it, it's a nice place to to deviate and, you know, have a little uh, a little break and, and then move, move on to your journey. Yeah, one of the recommendations in the TOD, the downtown Danbury TOD plan was kind of to activate, help activate the public spaces would have those kinds of uses and or spaces, um, you know, downtown. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in the design of phase two, actually, of the sidewalk project, we actually bumped a wall out, um, or a little retaining wall out in the section between <laughs> Library Place and, I guess, Elm Street, um, to increase the, the, the available um, space, for, which could be used for that kind of a purpose. Yeah. So creating more of a hardscape area where adjacent uh, property owners and or uses could like utilize the, um, the side. Sure. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a large expansive park or anything, just a little, you know, like a little alcove where it's a little nook or something where you could duck into and en enjoy 10 or 15 minutes of, of whatever you want to enjoy. Yep. So. Got it. Joel. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, related to what Rich is saying and and uh, and Sharon about the uh, downtown scape, if you will, uh, we could put a bug in the ears over there. Uh, I guess related to you in the zoning commission to set up requirements for pocket pa uh, parks in downtown development in that uh, uh, that in that zone. Yeah. I mean, that would certainly... And if I may, sorry, go ahead, Rich. No, that would certainly help because it would put everybody on the same page and force people to perhaps include that in their design so that, you know, when they're building something, everybody's needs are taken into account. You know, those that they're building it for as well as the the residents or the community at whole that, that are living here. So I, I think that's an excellent idea is to perhaps try to get them to, to uh, be part of this team, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to just make things a little bit better and, and, and dress up places where people can, 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 you know, feel relaxed. And if I may quickly, with Sharon's help, uh, that's something that city center is trying to focus on a little more using some of uh, the taxpayer dollars to put some tangible assets down that people could enjoy. Um, we're actually focused on a plan right now to develop a little underutilized uh, alcove nook that overlooks the Still River uh, along, uh, is it Patriot, Sharon? Yep, I'm Patriot, yep. Yep, so pocket parks, hopefully one is on, on the way already and uh, well received. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Okay. If I can just jump in on that one, on the pocket park. So we built one in about 20 years ago, Blind Book. We spent a lot of time, and this is one of the issues with urban pocket parks, a lot of time on, on sort of counter-program behavioral and enforcement issues. That is something you need to keep in mind with downtown parks. It's something that um, they're known for, so it, they can be problematic. They're great ideas, um, but they can lead to unintended consequences. Sharon? Yes, go ahead, Frank. Uh, I have to agree with Paul. Uh, I think it's a great idea, but uh, uh, in that particular area, I think you would have to take a long look and, and, uh, and see how you could secure or, or put security uh, when, it's, when it was needed. I, I just don't, I don't think that it's the best area for, for pocket parts in, in that particular area. Just so a thought. I, I, yeah, I, I think what we're really getting at here is that the downtown needs more tree canopy. 
And so, you know, may, maybe it's that we're not talking about seating areas and benches and amenities that attract loitering where you don't want it, but it's that we're talking about areas where you can get some plants and trees in, in force and in place and, and just get a little shade on the sidewalk and maybe uh, just a small place for someone to get out of the sun momentarily. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, we, right, we're, we're very focused at least now on addressing the environmental issues and, and the environmental issue in downtown and, and just about any downtown for that matter, and it's increasingly becoming an issue, is um, heat in the, in the summer. Right. I agree. Great. Anybody else? I don't see anybody. You want to uh, jump? Uh, we, I think Marcy talked about Francisco. We just yeah. jump. Okay. So let, let's uh, let's. Keep that was going. good, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Wrap things up. Uh, Marcy talked about uh, this already. Um, uh, Sharon and, and we talked about this. Sharon reached out to the high school. They were very receptive to the idea of um, of helping us with outreach, and I think it would be absolutely fantastic to uh, conduct some outreach with high school students, and and because they'll get their parents interested as well. Uh, so we're still trying to figure out exactly what that's going to look like, but that might involve us uh, doing a, a pop up event at the high school, encouraging them to take surveys and posting some flyers at the high school with the, the survey link uh, so that we can to participate. And, and I think that would be a, a tremendous success if we could hear from high school age kids. Um, uh, so the, uh, the survey's already been prepared. I'll show you, give you an idea of what that looks like in a moment. And um, we're gearing up for the farmer's market. And we also wanna start thinking about conducting focus group meetings and Sharon and I still need to hash this out. You know, what does it look like? When do we do it? But uh, I think October, November would be a great time to conduct some meetings. Uh, you know, realistically, with everything in front of us, November might be more realistic. But um, I, I, I think we're uh, we're leaning towards topic-based focus groups. So uh, you know, similar to the way we've been conducting uh, these oversight committee discovery meetings. It would be a meeting on transportation infrastructure and a meeting on open space environmental resources. And we'd invite in all the key stakeholders. And, uh, you know, given the way things are going now, these are most likely to be virtual. Uh, so that those are the, the moving pieces. The online survey is uh, we're trying to get it. We're trying to launch it uh, by uh, the end of this week. Um, and uh, it's as Marcy mentioned, it'll be in three languages, English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So we're casting a pretty wide net. Uh, and it takes a uh, survey, will take about 10, 15 minutes to complete, depending on which portions of it you elect to take. And I think it's gonna be in incredibly uh, valuable to us in this process, particularly with us being somewhat limited in our outreach because of COVID, the, this survey is gonna be really important to our work. So I'm really looking forward to getting this launched. Uh, we've already begun key stakeholder interviews. And to date, we've interviewed representatives from Danbury Museum, Candlewood Lake Authority, Ed, of course, who's on the call, uh, Still River Alliance, Terrywell Park Authority, and, and various divisions of DPW. Um, uh, Incidentally, or concurrently, we are working uh, on the city's affordable housing plan uh, and a brief overview of what that is. Uh, this is a new mandate by the state uh, to uh, encourage compliance with a statute that's been around for a long time. It's called 830G. That's a section of the state statute uh, that basically requires or uh, compels towns and cities to work towards having 10% of their occupied housing be uh, affordable as defined by the state. And it's a pretty strict criteria. Uh, Danbury is in excess of that limit, but only just by a couple of percent. So you're around 12% affordable housing. And um, that's not a static number. It can shrink 
as certain properties are are no longer deed restricted uh, and they've come off the rolls. In addition to that, you've had a lot of housing development over the past decade. The new census numbers are coming out and so you're gonna have bigger housing numbers. So uh, your share of affordable housing might shrink a little bit because of that. Uh, so it's, it's important that um, we uh, get a, uh, take a close look at this issue and figure out what the city can do to ensure that it's providing affordable housing in compliance with the state mandate. And also um, looking at the bigger picture to figure out uh, what the city needs to do to provide housing that's affordable to your residents and attracts, uh, you know, attracts and retains residents as well so that uh, your population remains uh, stable and the growth it, is sustainable. Um, uh, Joel, all, Joel has a quick question. One sec, Francisco. Yeah, yeah. Joel, go, all of this is directly ties into the POCD effort. Joel, okay, uh, just a comment. Uh, if the Zoning Commission, uh, I guess this, this week, uh, passes a, um, a requested change uh, related to the transitional homeless shelter over on um, Lake Avenue Extension, the numbers uh, for affordable housing under state definition uh, should improve. Uh, that it should improve noticeably, uh, but it still doesn't address affordable senior housing, which is uh, the long-term need, long needs for uh, people that uh, would like to stay here and not move to Florida. I, I, you know, I'm not familiar with that project, Joel, but I'm not sure that it would <laughs> it contributes to or would contribute to uh, the state's. Yes, it's, it does. It does. By definition. Yeah, it yeah does. that's a, it's a specific. Yeah, I can explain it to you offline, okay. but there are specific right. restrictions in it. So the, so the units would count either under under towards the inventory, either on the list or under a moratorium okay. application. All right. So that that's something that, you know, we'll, we would, right, we would uh, kind of get our heads wrapped around that as part of the affordable housing plan process. Right. Uh, right. We just kicked that off last last week, last uh, Monday. Um, and so we're very early in the process and uh, we'll, we'll be doing a limited amount of public engagement that's, that's tailored to that plan and and, and really, this is, this is it's really uh, interlaced with everything we're doing within the POCD and, and the, the housing issues we're addressing within the POCD. So the, the timing is really good here. Yeah, let me just uh, also say, if you're interested in seeing the PowerPoint presentation that Francisco and Eric, if you remember, he's the housing consultant, um, subs consultant to um, FHI, that's yeah. posted on our website. There's a link to the Affordable Housing Committee, and you can you can look through those slides if you want. Okay, uh, and uh, as a reminder, our website, uh, it, it's, uh, we are very soon gonna have the survey link up on the website too. So look for that. We'll probably put it right on the, the homepage. And um, you are all uh, invited, of course, to take the survey. So uh, you will hopefully play a role in promoting, taking it and promoting it yourself. Um, and with respect to our project schedule, we're nearing the end of the discovery process. Uh, we have a couple more meetings where we'll be reviewing our existing conditions or discovery findings, and then we're going to start to pivot to the developing the plan and you know coming up with the the needs that we want to address and setting some goals and developing strategies. And so our, our meeting next month, we are going to review city facilities and services, and uh, we're continuing our outreach work and all of our, our data collection continues. And that next meeting is on Tuesday, October 19th at 4 p.m. as, as usual. And that uh, concludes our presentation. And Sharon, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Francisco. We lots of inf lots of good information. Um, um, so we appreciate all the good and hard work. Um, and we are we're excited about launching the survey. We 
trying to, you know, get to the farmer's market <laughs> this weekend, um, doing press releases, working, you know, all, all the social media angles. Um, I think getting into the high school is going to be a good thing. And as Richard suggested, mm -hmm. just using the, the Board of Education, the opportunity to, um, to get the survey out to, to parents um, in a different way would be helpful as well. Um, so unless anybody has any other comments, thanks Francisco and his team, and I'll take a motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. Motion by Fred to adjourn. Second by anyone? Second Sharon Perry. Second by Perry. All in favor? It is Aye. 545. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, we are adjourned.